check, check, check. Good morning. Don't we miss our music? Yeah, so Martha, if you're watching this morning, we miss you and we hope you're feeling better soon. She's under the weather with her belly this morning, so um, we're hoping that she was back with us this week. So, how's everybody doing? We're a skeleton crew this morning. So good morning to all of you who are in person and good morning to all of you who are joining us online. Uh, especially good morning to our folks from Nine Mile River. They've decided to keep their uh, worship uh, sanctuary closed until the beginning of March, so right up till the end of February. So they might join us sometimes, or they might just be online. And so uh, we are grateful for everyone that is present with us this morning. It's funny, we see, we look around and say, gee, there's not many in church. <laughs> but now we know that we are not alone. There are a lot of people that are watching online as well. So how many so far this morning, Maggie? There you go, 23 already. So 23 plus you. Yeah, so that's pretty cool. That's pretty cool. So I welcome you to this place, um, and I'm going to invite Gary forward for announcements. Morning, everyone. A couple of little announcements. Uh, number one is tomorrow night at 7 o'clock, there will be a stewards meeting. We're going to discuss having another takeout. Uh, and then on Wednesday night is the executive meeting. The meeting itself starts at the business part of it, starts at 7.30. Uh, we have a grounding part just before that for a half an hour. So if you want to show up for either one of those meetings, you're more than welcome. So. That's all you got? When is FunScript due? Do you know? Uh, FunScript fun fun is being done today. Oh, there you go. There you go. So if you need to get your fun script in, get it to Vanessa uh, right after That's church. Right. Vanessa's downstairs this morning. Yeah. Excellent. All right. Well, as we gather for worship this morning, uh, we pause and we take this moment to remember that here where we live and we work and we worship is on land that are as by, is by law the unceded territory of the Mi'kmaq people. And together we say, may we live with respect on this land and in peace and friendship with its people. Umsit Nogama. All my relations, we are all treaty people. We light the Christ candle, and as we do, we light it as a symbol for the light of Christ here with us this morning. As we do that, I'm going to invite you to stand and repeat with me our new creed. We are not alone. We live in God's world. We believe in God who has created and is creating. It has come in Jesus, the word made flesh, to reconcile and make new, who works in us and others by the Spirit. Trust in God. We celebrate God's presence, to live with respect in creation, to love and serve others, to seek justice and resist evil to proclaim Jesus crucified and risen, our judge and our hope in life, in death, in life beyond death. God is with us. We are not alone. Thanks be to God. Remain standing for our call to worship. So in our call to worship today, you see it says, say your name. Don't say, say your name. Actually, say your name. Okay? So let's read this together. Jesus comes alongside us and calls us by name. Kim, follow me. A simple call, a hard call, because following requires leaving. And we look around to see who else Jesus could be talking to. And we look around to see the trappings of the life we know. It's hard to leave our nets and walk away from the lake. But we have come this far to this place where we can listen and be transformed. Have a seat. And we pray our prayer of invocation, our prayer sometimes called the opening prayer. Let us pray. Insistent God, by night and day you summon your slumbering people. So stir us with your voice and enlighten our lives with your grace that we give ourselves fully to Christ's call to mission and ministry. And all God's people said, Amen. Our first hymn is a familiar one. It is, Let us 
build a house for more voices, number one. Uh, it's sung today for us by the, um, the staff at Peninsula United Church in Surrey, BC. The words are on the screen. Um, please do not sing. We're not allowed yet. We're still waiting to hear on how that's going to work. Um, but you, just so you can follow along with the lyrics. I'll now for our time of our prayer of reconciliation, sometimes called our prayer of confession, our time to turn our faces back to God. Let us pray. And we say this together. How foolish we are to think that we can hide our failings from you seeing God. We treat our bodies as trash cans for junk food, not as sanctuaries for your spirit. We get drunk on the seductions of our society while daintily sipping at your living water. We doze under the tree of temptation, hoping you won't see us and expect us to get up and follow Jesus. Forgive us our heart's only hope. Your grace mends our brokenness, making us whole. Your compassion removes our sin, making us new. Your voice speaks tenderly to us, 
silencing our pride. Your love is made human in Jesus Christ, our Lord and Savior, redeeming our lives. We take a moment for a prayer of silence, turning your own heart back to God. Amen. In front of us, behind us, to our left and to our right, look, God is there. In our past, beside us today, waiting in the future, look, God is there. In the shadows, in the light, God is there. From the top of the mountains to the bottoms of the sea, in the morning and in the evening, in every moment, God is with us. Thanks be to God. Amen. I'm going to invite Murray forward. Um, I'm going to read the first scripture reading, and then Murray will take over from there. So our first scripture reading this morning is uh, from the Hebrew Bible. It's from 1 Samuel, verses 3, uh, chapter 1, right through till 20. It's Samuel's calling and prophetic activity. Now the boy Samuel was ministering to the Lord under Eli. The word of the Lord was rare in those days. Visions were not widespread. At that time, Eli, whose eyesight had begun to grow dim so that he could not see, was lying down in his room. The lamp of God had not yet gone out, and Samuel was lying down in the temple of the Lord where the ark of, the, of God was. Then the Lord called, Samuel, Samuel, and he said, Here I am. But he said it to Eli, you called me. But Eli said, I did not call. Go lie down again. So he went and he lay down and the Lord called him again, saying, Samuel, Samuel. So Samuel got up, he went to Eli again, and you know how it goes. He said, here I am, you called me. And Eli said, I did not call you, my son. Go lay down again. So Samuel did not know that the Lord was calling him, and the word of the Lord had not been revealed to him yet. So the Lord called Samuel again, a third time, and you know what he did? He got up, and he went to Eli, and he said, here I am, for you called me. You can tell he's probably pretty frustrated at this point, like, stop waking me up, man. Then Eli perceived that the Lord was calling the boy. Eli was like, I know what this is. Therefore, Eli said to Samuel, go lie down, and if he calls you, you shall say, speak, Lord, for your servant is listening. So Samuel went and lay down in his place. Now the Lord came and stood there, calling as before, Samuel, Samuel. And Samuel said, as he had been told by Eli, speak, for your servant is listening. Then the Lord said to Samuel, See, I am about to do something in Israel that will make both ears of everyone who hears of it tingle. On that day I will fulfill against Eli all that I have spoken concerning his house from the beginning to the end. For I have told them that I am about to punish his house forever for the iniquity he knew because his sons were blaspheming God and he did not restrain them. Therefore, I swear to the house of Eli that the iniquity of Eli's house shall not be expiated by sacrifice or offering forever. Samuel lay there until morning. Then he opened the doors of the house of the Lord, and Samuel was afraid to tell the vision to Eli. But Eli called Samuel and said, Samuel, my son, he said, here I am. And Eli said, what was it that he told you? Do not hide it from me. May God do so to you and more also if you hide anything from me of all that he told you. So Samuel told him everything and hid nothing from him. Then he said, it is the Lord. Let him do what seems good to him. As Samuel grew up, the Lord was with him and let none of his words fall to the ground. And all Israel from Dan to Beersheba knew that Samuel was a trustworthy prophet of the Lord. Here ends the reading.
now reading from Psalm 139, and we'll read it responsively with Murray, and it'll be on the screen. Of David, a psalm. O Lord, you have searched me and known me. You know when I sit down and when I rise up. You discern my thoughts from far away. You search out my path and my lying down and are acquainted with all my ways. Even before a word is on my tongue, O Lord, you know it completely. You hem me in behind and before and lay your hand upon me. Such knowledge is too wonderful for me. It is so high that I cannot attain it. For it was you who formed my inward parts. You knit me together in my mother's womb. I praise you, for I am fearfully and wonderfully made. Wonderful are your works that I know very well. My frame was not hidden from you when I was being made in secret, intricately woven in the depths of the earth. Your eyes beheld my unformed substance. In your brook were written all the days that were formed for me when none of them as yet existed. How weighty to me are your thoughts, O God. How vast is the sum of them. I try to count them. They are more than the sand. I come to the end. I am still with you. Reading from John 1, verses 43 to 51. Jesus calls, calls Philip and Nathanael. The next day, Jesus decided to go to Galilee. He found Philip and said to him, Follow me. Now Philip was from Bethsaida, the city of Andrew and Peter. Philip found Nathanael and said to him, We have found him about whom Mo Moses in the law and also the prophets wrote, Jesus, son of Joseph from, from Nazareth. And Nathanael said to him, Can anything good come out of N Nazareth? Philip said to him, Come and see. When Jesus saw Nathanael coming towards him, he said to him, Here is truly an Israelite in whom there is no deceit. Nathanael asked him, Where did you come to know me? Jesus answered, I saw you under the fig tree before Philip called you. Nathanael replied, Rabbi, you are the Son of God. You are the King of Israel. Jesus answered, Do you believe because I told you that I saw you under the fig tree? You will see greater things than these. And he said to him, Very truly, I tell you, you will see heaven opened and the angels of God ascending and descending upon the Son of Man. May God add to our understanding the reading of this Holy Scripture. We have a hymn to reflect on before our message today, and it's another familiar one. Again, the words are on the screen. Avoid the temptation, but definitely uh, follow along the words. Take <laughs>
What a great recording. It sounded like they were right here. Will you pray with me? Holy One, let the words that I share reach the hearts that need to hear them. Let the thoughts I share turn our thoughts to you, and may all of us this morning, all gathered here and at home, be open to hearing and seeing you wherever we look and wherever we listen. Amen. So, today's readings have a common thread. Did you hear them? Jan Richardson, who I often uh, use her blessings at the end of worship, and actually I'm using one today, she said it like this. She said, I've got to scroll up. <laughs> that part I don't know because it's not my word. She said, with each passage, the lectionary readings, the readings that are assigned to us for this week, present us with a God who calls to us, seeks us out, draws close to us, inhabit us again and again the word no appears as in k-n-o-w its repetition presses upon us how serious god is about wanting to know us and us to know god god is serious about wanting to know us and about us knowing god do you believe that i sure do and we found it in the stories that we heard today, from the Lord calling to Samuel and Samuel mistaking God's call as the call of his elder Eli, to the precious psalm of David that we shared with Murray this morning, that poetically sings of God's knowledge of us from our very beginnings. Even in the reading from the lectionary from 1 Corinthians we didn't actually read today, that one reminds us that God is in our bodies, our bodies are to be a temple for God, residing in us. And finally, Jesus, you heard, calling Philip and Nathaniel to follow him. God has always called God's people from every age, time, and place. God calls, and we listen. Unfortunately, we listen with imperfect human ears that sometimes hear God calling and follow the ways of another master instead, much like Samuel and Eli this morning. Like Samuel, we hear a voice, and we figure it must belong to something familiar, because most of us wouldn't consider that God is calling just to us. Just like our worship, uh, call to worship at the beginning, we look around and think, who, me? And we look for the familiar. We have um, a hard time believing what we haven't already experienced. So we only hear and see sometimes what we know already. Yet, even though God made us and knows us and knows that we're like that, God still calls us again and again and again. And our stories from Scripture today and in the stories of our own lives, God calls to us in dreams, in our songs and in our poems, inside from our own bodies, and in the form of other human beings that show up and take us by the hand when we least expect us, sec them, and walk us towards living in relationship with God. Today's gospel reading is a prime example. So in the verses before today's reading from our gospel of John, our teacher, the man we call Jesus, has been baptized, we heard that last week, has been baptized by John in the River Jordan. The next day, when John was still in Bethany, he was there with two of his disciples. One is unnamed and the other one is Andrew who was Simon Peter's brother. John sees Jesus passing by, and what does he say? You heard Murray say it this morning. Look, the Lamb of God. Actually, no, you didn't hear that one. This is in the passage just before that. He says, look, the Lamb of God. 
And Jesus' two followers run to Jesus and say, Rabbi, which means teacher, where are you staying? And Jesus very simply just looks at them and says, come and see. So they went and they spent the day with him right, right until about 4 o'clock in the afternoon. And after their time with him was over, Andrew immediately goes and finds his brother Peter and tells him that they had found the one promised to the people who was sent by God to save them. He says they have found the Messiah. They have found Christ. So the two disciples bring Simon, who's yet to be called Peter, forgive me, to Jesus. And he renames him Cephas, which means Peter, which means the rock, which is the rock on which the church will be built. And then we come to our story from today, which says the next day. This time Jesus finds Philip. And he says to Philip, follow me. There's a great song I was trying to find where I don't have Martha to play music for reflection, but it wouldn't upload fast enough for me this morning. It's by Brian Sergio, um, and I think I might have played it before, 87 times, Jesus says, follow me. It's a great tune. But again, he says, follow me. So Philip does. Philip finds Nathaniel and tells him that they have found Jesus and calls him the one that Moses said was coming, the one that Moses talked about in the law, the one that the prophets also spoke about. And Nathaniel is in disbelief, especially when Philip says he's the Messiah and he comes from Nazareth. And what does Nathaniel say? Hello. He says, nothing good can come from Nazareth. Imagine. Imagine if somebody was telling you a story and was like, nothing good can come from Lance. Nothing good can come from Rawdon. Right? This is because it was a tiny little rural place, right? It was a village. And Nathaniel, you know, he's thinking that, you know, if the Messiah is going to come, he's going to come from Jerusalem right? He's going to come from somewhere very important. They never expected the warrior that they thought was coming to come from a place like Nazareth, a place of about 80 families, a place of ordinary people. But that is indeed where Jesus came from. But Philip, he doesn't argue. He doesn't argue with Nathaniel or anything. What does he do? He does exactly what Jesus did in the previous passages, and he just says, Come follow me. Come and see. So repeating those words that Jesus said to Andrew, Nathaniel goes and he follows him. He comes and sees. And Jesus, God with us, recognizes Nathaniel immediately. And Nathaniel says, how do you know me? And all Jesus says is, well, I saw you. That's all it took for him to know Nathaniel so now Nathaniel has come and seen, and now that this man is indeed what Philip says he is, he knows this just by seeing him. He sees him, Jesus sees him, and they just know each other. He believed. And picture this, Jesus says, you believe just by seeing me? You think that's something? Just wait and see. So this is how Christ greets each and every one of us. Christ sees us and knows us. God sees us and knows us through and through, from before we were here till after we are gone. When God sees us, they know us. Wouldn't it be great that when we saw God, we knew them right away? I wonder if we might be able to do that if we were actually looking for them all the time. But we're not. Across cultures, we are taught that God is in everyone we meet. In yoga, we say namaste, which means the light in me bows to the light in you. Here, we offer the peace of Christ, the peace of Christ to you from inside me to you. 
But that is a practice that is definitely easier said than done. More often, we think we see something or hear something and just assume that somebody is who we think they is, they is. <laughs> who we think they are. I've been working with they, them pronouns all week and I'm struggling a bit, so be patient with me. We think they are by our previous experiences with maybe people like them, for example, or in experiences that we've had before in situations like a certain situation, and we, we are apt to judge before ever even looking for God within another. Just like Samuel just knew that it must be Eli calling to him in the middle of the night, and it wasn't until Eli told him Eli came to light and said, ah, I know who that is. This is the Lord. And when you hear the Lord, you say, here I am. Speak. It wasn't until Andrew called Peter that he came to know Christ. And it wasn't until Philip called Nathaniel that he saw the Lord. Sometimes us humans need a little help to see and hear what is right in front of us. As Christians, as followers of Christ, that is always the call to us. Come and see. Sometimes that call comes in the voice in the night. Sometimes from the center of your chest. Sometimes in a friend that takes you by the hand and leads you to come and see God in your relationship, in your relationship with yourself, with your community, with one another. Jesus, God with us, comes and shows us God in the very flesh. He came to put a face to the name of God. That face had been so distant from the people before that time. God with us came to see us in person and know us as followers. And as followers, we are called to see and know God and then invite others on this magnificent journey. I believe that we can see Christ when we see one another, like really see one another. When we see the hurt, in another's past, when we bear witness to the scars of their trauma, when we listen deeply to their stories, when we hold space for their pain. When we come to see God, when we seek to see another person, we come to know God when we really try to know another person. And we come to love God when we work especially hard to love one another unconditionally. So that's the call. Come and see. See and know. Seek and find. Look and follow. Christ is calling to each and every one of us in this life. And so as you go from this place today and into this week, I'd like you to ask yourself how you are listening for God. Where are you looking for Christ? What sacred space are you creating within your relationships, within your community, within yourself? How are you opening up yourself to the God who wants to know you and be known by you? And you know, it's okay to be as skeptical as Nathaniel was before he saw. But each of us, may we be open to recognize Christ when we feel seen and known by another. And then may we share that sacred moment of knowing with everyone we meet along the way. May it be so. Amen. Our music for reflection is the beating of your heart this morning. In Psalm 4610, we hear, Be still and know that I am God. 
So I'm going to invite you to shift around a little bit. You know I'm a yoga teacher too, right? We're going to do a little yoga. I know. What? <laughs> okay. It's very, very simple yoga. Are you ready? It's a mudra, which means a hand position. And you know what? I think you already know it. This is called Anjali Mudra, prayer hands. So I invite you to take your prayer hands, bring them into your chest, and for this next minute, just allow yourself to be still as you reflect on those questions, listening for how God is calling to you. Staring down at the tip of your fingers is a lovely place to look, or just feeling them in your heart with your eyes closed. Be still and know that I'm with you. Be still and know that I am with you. Be still and know that I'm with you. Be still, be still and know. Amen. So we have, um, last week we started Called to Be the Church. So it's part of a stewardship campaign from the United Church of Canada. And the videos that we're showing in the place of our Minute for Mission videos are an introduction to this program that would normally be shown um, to a group of stewards, for example, or a group of people that were interested in doing this kind of project. But I thought it would be really interesting to show them in church, and then maybe we would garner up some interest in the project, and because you kind of know what to expect and what it's all about from the videos themselves. Um, this video is from Rob Fennell, who is, uh, was the Dean of Academics at AST and is a uh, ordained minister in the United Church, Dr. Rob Fennell. He is uh, passionate about uh, what he's going to talk about. I'm not going to spoil it for you. And um, Hmm, what else can I tell you about it? Oh, at the end of the video, I don't know, I haven't watched the whole thing through. I probably should have, but I didn't. Um, he, unlike, remember last week when it said, okay, now turn to your neighbor and have a conversation, and we're not going to do that. So if there's that part there in the, in the end of the video, we're just listening to see what the videos are like this time and see if they inspire us to want to uh, work with this program in our church. Churches. Here we go. Hi there, I want to talk to you for a few minutes about stewardship and fundraising, and I promise it won't be boring. I think many of us would rather stick needles in our eyes than talk about money at church. I know that feeling myself. A number of years ago, I was at a conference where a speaker told us that two-thirds of Jesus' parables were connected to money or resources in some way. That, he said, gives us all the permission we need to talk about money and to talk about it often. I remember being impressed by those numbers, being impressed by the fraction, but I also remember not being very impressed by my own reluctance, my own hesitation, when I saw that Stewardship Sunday was looming on the calendar. Since then, I've started to think about this whole stewardship thing a little bit differently. I'm pretty sure, for example, that one Stewardship Sunday a year really doesn't do much to 
engage people's hearts or to change their minds in a substantial way. And carefully counting my sermons so that exactly two-thirds of them are about money and resources, that kind of misses the point too. But imagining my life as a steward, an imperfect one, still learning in the way of Jesus, my life as a steward, that started to make more sense to me. None of us has the magic words that will make people be generous, but all of us have hearts that were formed and shaped by a gracious God. All of us have lives that are like containers full of blessings that God intends to pour through us into the church and into the wider world. All of us are made in the image of God, and that image is of love and freedom and grace-filled self-giving. But fundraising is always about getting cash in the coffers. I know that people like to talk about these events as fundraisers. If it was really about fun, we would just call it a party. Fundraising is about getting cash in the coffers. Stewardship though, being a steward, living the life of a steward for real, that is about how we make up our minds to follow in the way of Jesus. Spiritual leaders need to give attention to this. Not only are we leading by example, not only are we called upon to speak about money with integrity and wisdom, but our whole selves have always already been named and claimed for a purpose, for a godly purpose. Stewardship as a process of filling up the coffers is always going to be lackluster, I think. Stewardship as just fundraising is always going to fall flat. But living in the way of Jesus, living with all of the heartache and pain and beauty and wonder and promise that God offers us, that's a life I want to embrace. That's the life of a steward. interesting video. Do I have my mic on? Here I am. Um, so a good video thinking about the difference between, I mean both are important, but thinking the difference between stewardship and fundraising and where they meet together. So really interesting conversation could be started out of something like that. So now is the time where we do come together and we, we accept our offering. We accept the monies and the time and the talent that we uh, take into the church. So I invite you to this time of offering. There are many ways to donate to the life and the work of this church in the world. Uh, we can put it in the offering plate on our way in or out of church today. Are we allowed to use the back door today? The back door is safe to use today, not too icy out there after all our warm rain. Um, but we can also donate through email money transfer, through pre-authorized uh, pre remittance, which is um, my preferred way for all the things that I, that I donate to. Just, it just comes out. You don't even have to think about it. Um, and so, um, yeah, you can find that on our website, www.elmsdalecooperativeministry.com, under the Donate tab. So let us bring to God our gifts in response to God's gracious love. Let us bring to God our lives in response to Christ's call to serve others. That is true stewardship. Let us join together in our morning offering as we rise and we dedicate our offering with prayer. Generous God, we have known your unfailing love and faithfulness, your care and provision, your protection and salvation. And so we respond with deep gratitude, offering back to you a portion of what you have given to us. Accept the gifts we bring, tangible expressions of our love and gratitude for what you have so generously given to us. Amen. Please be seated. We have a pastoral epiphany prayer this morning. Let us prepare to pray. Beloved God, you know us inside and out, and you still call us to serve you. Lord, honestly, we are often hesitant, afraid, and wish to remain hidden. Empower us to listen and to hear your call. Empower us to answer your call with 
here I am, Lord. Empower us to follow you when you call us to follow you. Lord of mercy and justice, so many have gone before us working to bring justice and peace to our country and into our world. Their footsteps seem too big to step into to continue the work you have called us all to. So we hesitantly step one step at a time, bringing your seeds of hope, justice, and peace in a world crying out for them. Lord of our hope, we pray for our country, our leaders, and especially for our leaders in the south of us at this time. We pray for our churches, our partners in the U.S. who have been warned this week as liberal churches that they are under threat today and on Inauguration Day. We pray for healing in North America and around the world for reconciliation, forgiveness, and peace. Lord of peace, we pray for your compassion and healing for those individuals in our congregation who need it. We pray for your comfort and presence for those who are grieving, lonely, and oppressed. We pray for warmth, shelter, and clothing for all who are without. Lord, we say to you this day, here we are, your servants, willing to preach your word, offer care where care is needed, presence where presence is needed, your love where your love is needed. Lord, strengthen us for our ministry today and every day. We add this prayer and all the prayers to our hearts, to the one prayer that Jesus taught us as we lift everything to you, God. Our Father, Mother, God in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us today our daily bread. Forgive us our sin as we forgive those who sin against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. Since the kingdom, the power, and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. Now remember when I spoke in the sermon about looking and listening for God and Christ all over the place. One of the ways that I almost always hear God calling to me is in song. And this particular song when I was going through is one that um, uh, I, I heard God. And sometimes when you hear songs you think, oh that's a nice song about friendship or about love or about whatever. But if you listen deeply, sometimes you hear Christ calling. And I wonder if you will hear. It's called Rise Up. It's a song by uh, Andra Day, or Ad Andra? Audra. Andra. I don't know. Andra Day. Um, and it's sung to us today by the African Gospel Choir of Dublin. Um, I'll share a couple of the lyrics after in case you can't quite hear them, but you should, you should be able to hear them. But I picture when I listen to this song, um, someone that's kind of feeling down and out and finding that person that comes beside them and says, I'll walk with you a little while. And there is Christ walking with us. Rise up. You're broken down and tired of living life on a merry-go-round. And you can't find the fighter, but I see it in you. So we gon' walk it out ooh, and move mountains. We gon' walk it out.
silence isn't quiet feels like it's getting hard to breathe and i know you feel like dying but i promise we'll take the world to its feet and move mountains bring it to its feet a powerful call and a powerful response. And when I hear, we will rise up, despite of the ache, I will rise up. Despite of the pain, I will rise up for you, for you. And so I invite you to rise up for our closing blessing. It's a blessing by Jan Richardson, who we use quite often, um, because she's just so darn good. Thank you, Jan, for all of your work that you share with the world. So to receive this blessing, it's called the blessing of knowing. To receive this blessing, it might feel like you are peeling back every layer of flesh, exposing every nerve, burying each bone that has kept you upright. It may seem that every word is written on the back of something that your life depends on. That to read this blessing would mean tearing away what has helped you remain intact. Be at peace. It will not be as painful as that. Though I cannot say that it will be easy to accept this blessing. Written as it is upon your true frame, inscribed on the skin that you were born to live in. The habits that keep you from yourself, the misconceptions others have of you, the unquestioned limits you have allowed, the smallness you have squeezed into, these are not who you are. This blessing, this blessing simply wants you to let all of that fall away. This blessing, and it is stubborn on this point, I assure you, desires you to know yourself as it knows you. To let go of every layer that is not you. To release each thing that you hide behind. To open your eyes and see what it sees. How this blessing has blazed in you since you were born. How it has sustained you when you could not even see it how it haunts you 
prickling beneath your skin to let it shine forth in full and unstinting measure. How it begins and ends in your true name. Amen. We extinguish our Christ candle each week as a moment to recognize that this time together is over. This time of worship has come to a conclusion. But your time of service to God through serving and loving one another begins again now. Go now in peace. See you next week.